I was thinking about when I started really eating healthy and how much better it made me feel. And every now and then when I actually eat a bad meal and I have, you know, I have my pizza nights, I have some ice cream, popcorn here and there, but it's, it's the exception, not the norm. How utterly horrible I feel the next day. And then it kind of reminds me of like, this is why I'm eating healthy because it is actually something that makes me feel better, but I don't eat, um, I don't eat foods I hate. One of the things for me in my weight loss journey was really find foods that are healthy that I enjoy because that's much easier to stick with than, you know, just hating salad, right? And that's the thing uh, I used to do all the time. And the reason I bring this up is in this conversation with Jared Schurz, him and I are actually working together, uh, doing an event in Monmouth, New Jersey. And you'll see I screw that up because I said Monmouth, PA, uh, Pennsylvania in the, the podcast. Uh, I actually talk about um, that experience. And the reason I bring it up is because when my, I didn't really correct my eating habits, I ate poorly all the time. And I felt gross all the time, but feeling gross was normal for me that I didn't even really notice it. And Jared talks about this idea of avoiding teacher burnout and identifying this. And one of the things I asked him about, we talk about in this podcast is sometimes we're like so into something that we don't realize how exhausted we are because we're so normalized to being exhausted that when you do actually start to find things that bring you energy, then you're like, oh, I, I wasn't in the best way there. And so it was kind of interesting to talk about this. And so he gives some strategies on not only how as an individual, you can avoid that, that burnout in education, but really some ideas for how you can do that uh, as a system leader. How do you actually create, you know, schools and districts that don't create the problem in the first place. And that's one of the things that we talked about in this podcast. And he's a clinical psychologist. He worked as an education counselor. So he has some really good uh, st stories, ideas, and anecdotes um, for this. So I know you're going to love this podcast. I, I would love to know in the comments down below, what is a strategy that you use to ensure that you create that space where you actually not just avoid teacher burnout, but actually come to school, come to your job with energy. Cause I think there's a difference between just not being exhausted versus feeling energized because I'd rather, you know, feel energized, just not, not be exhausted. And so I'd love your, your strategies, your ideas in the comments below, please like, and subscribe to this video, but I am so excited to share this conversation with you. Cause I know it's going to help a lot of people. Welcome back to another episode of the innovators mindset podcast. Hey everyone, this is George Kuros. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Today, I actually have Jared Schurz on the podcast. And Jared uh, is currently a clinical psychologist. He actually was also an elementary guidance counselor. Uh, we connected because uh, I'm keynoting an event in Monmouth, Pennsylvania. I want to make sure I'm saying and that's Jared told me that. So if I said it wrong, that's a Jared thing, right? So hopefully I got it right. So I said Monmouth, so I, that's how it's spelled. But um, yeah, we just kind of talked about uh, what we're presenting there. So I'm looking forward to uh, some of the ideas that you have to to share when when you're there and connecting uh, my work to innovation and your work to really kind of creating some of that psychological safety. Uh, and also, you, I know you talk about avoiding burnout. But before we get into that, because I'm sure a lot of people that watch this podcast would be really interested on some of the strategies, some of the thinking behind um, how you help educators, you know, avoid burnout because that's happening more than ever. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do today and how you got to that point? Sure. It's nice to be here with you. Um, I'm looking forward to your, your keynote in uh, Monmouth, uh, New Jersey. Oh, and it's a new, I, I, I forgot. I'm getting mixed up. You know, I tell you that because I once told people so many times that I was headed to Denver when I was a kid, when I was actually headed to Utah, that I didn't get off the connecting flight and I ended up in Denver. So, <laughs> Listen, hey, I, you know what? I get. I, I live in. I'm from Canada, so I'll tell you straight up. Usually, we know uh, Canadians know U.S. geography better than the other way around. So <laughs> maybe I'll get a little a little pass for that today. Absolutely. Um, uh, there. Um, there isn't too much background for me. It's fairly simple. I've been working with educators for a few different decades. I've written a number of different books about school violence and school culture. 
and I'm very much focused on adult social emotional learning. I enjoy my work in New Jersey because the district leaders are such kind and thoughtful and well-intended people that it's really rewarding spending time, so much time with them. And it means a little less travel for me. And someone like yourself that does a lot of keynotes, I can imagine you would appreciate the, the convenience of traveling yeah. short distances. Absolutely. So and that, that actually, you know, that's, that's one of my keys to avoiding burnout is try to travel as little <laughs> as possible because it, it, it has done a number on me. Actually, I was just having a great conversation with someone right before we popped on here who does travel for work. And uh, I actually, you know, I, a lot of people that, you know, know my work, know a little bit about me. Uh, before COVID, traveling got to me so bad. I was horribly, probably unhealthy. Uh, mm. You know, during COVID, I lost a lot of weight. Um, just trying to get my health back in check because, you know, there's things being thrown off routines, things like that are really struggling. So yeah, that, that is uh, something I appreciate when I can, you know, drive to an event. It's, it's an amazing opportunity. And so you talked about um, adult social emotional learning. I think a lot of times when you hear about social emotional learning, it is really focused on our students, the kids in, in schools. So is there like, is there a difference between what you talk about or is there like, obviously there's gotta be some connections between things you can do with students and you can do with adults. So when you talk about that adult social emotional learning, what do you mean by that? If we can focus a bit more on the adults in the system, then they will embody the type of learning that we actually want them passing along and modeling for the students. So not only do we get more invested, happier, healthier educators, mm -hmm. but we get people who are going to understand the nature of what they're trying to instill in students, as opposed to simply giving them a set of skills and strategies like much of the SEL training is today. And the content uh, of it is similar. The process is different. So when I say the content is similar, um, what I mean is that they're, the outcome or greater skills in the service of getting our needs met, because I think that's the part we miss with SEL. Social emotional learning or psychosocial emotional learning for me is all about how do we differentiate our wants from our needs? How do we recognize what those needs are and how do we build on them throughout our, our life cycle? What are the protective mechanisms that we employ that actually rob us of energy in getting those needs met? And then how do we do that to scale? So it involves a lot of a intrapersonal, interpersonal and systems kind of work, which is similar in content, a little different in process for what we do with students. It's funny because you, you know, you talk about that kind of that draining energy. I remember early on in my career, uh, when I was teaching, someone came to speak to our staff and they said, it's really weird that at the end of the day, kids will walk out with energy and the adults are exhausted when sometimes it actually should be the other way around, right? Like who's doing a ton of the work, who's doing that, that process. And even when you are talking about that kind of understanding the strategies from a viewpoint of experiencing them, as opposed to something that you implement for kids, but not for yourself is a really important aspect. And uh, I, I just wrote about this. I remember having this conversation with um, a teacher and they were talking about, you know, cause we were talking about stuff with technology utilizing it, and there's, she's like, well, kids need balance. Like we need balance. I'm like, yeah, like I think balance is actually a really important aspect of our lives. And so if you believe that, can I ask you, do you feel you're balanced? And she was like, oh God. Cause like she, she was talking about the importance of kids actually having that while feeling she was totally out of whack in her own scale. And a lot of times we say this is good for kids, but then we don't do it for ourselves. Do you find that happens quite a bit? Educators are caregivers. They're largely drawn to the profession because of their interest in nurturing young people. So by the simple nature of the work, the return on the investment is this vicarious satisfaction that comes with developing another human being. But it's really easy to get imbalance between giving and receiving. Right. So oftentimes educators will then replicate those same patterns in their personal life, come home, taking care of their own children, their own family, making dinner. And by the end of the day, they're so depleted that they 
um, then developed this sort of cumulative exhaustion. And before they even know it, they could get to a point where they're really questioning the, the reward, the satisfaction of their jobs. It, and it is funny because it does sneak up on you too, right? Like you, you, you feel that emotion, you feel that connection, you see kids. And, and a lot of times I feel, I know this happened in my career because I, I, I had suffered from um, some burnout myself. I remember I had to take a, 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 a mental health leave uh, for a little while. And you're so busy solving everyone else's problems and, you know, always being trying to be a good listener and you absorb a lot of that. But then all of a sudden you realize that you haven't taken care of yourself in the process. And it, it, it then it, it can't, I, maybe, and this is not true for everybody, but it did definitely sneak up on me to the point where I was just like, what, what just happened? You know, like what, like how did that get through that process? Do you have a, like a strategy, you know, to maybe to kind of identify that something that, people listening to this right now, because I, I guarantee you what you just said and what we just talked about is going to resonate with a lot of people. And some of them maybe just have a little eye opening moment. They're like, am I like exhausted? And I, and I don't realize this. Like, do you have a strategy um, that you might have for people just to kind of maybe identify that something that they can do to, you know, do early intervention as opposed to sometimes too late? The uh, starting point for me is always awareness. Mm -hmm. So that if we think about our energy level on a continuum between tired and exhausted, or if we think of a barometer of our energy, almost like a thermostat in a house, where if we get too overheated, the air conditioner kicks on and it cools things down. We pay attention to our own internal signals and really listen to them as opposed to treating them like symptoms. Mm -hmm. And when we can do that early on, we have a chance to say, okay, you know, where is our discomfort? Is it neck tension? Is it stomach aches? Is it this feeling of dread in the morning? Is it feeling so depleted by the end of the day that we're going to bed earlier? So we always have to begin by understanding what our body is telling us and treating it as a message, not a symptom to be treated. Mm -hmm. um, and because in this, listen, in this day and age, you know, it, it was exhausting being an educator before the pandemic, when you layer in exactly. public scrutiny, the extra workload, the constant threat of health issues going on and all of a sudden having to do this virtual learning, it seems like it's sneaking up on a person, but I think the last two or three years has really been a catalyst of exhaustion for people because we were just functioning in crisis mode. We didn't recognize just how much was impacting us all at the same time. So for some people, the awareness is just the tip of the iceberg. The strategy is on what to do about it. That's a whole, you know, right. another set of conversations, but I'll let you react to that first. Well, you know, so like I'm thinking about this because one part I'm struggling with and I, you know, it's very, um, it's very anecdotal. It's my own experience is I, I talk about like, I, I, I really try to eat healthy now. And I think the biggest solve for me when I, you know, started losing weight, getting back into better shape was not exercise. I was always exercising. It was my, my, my eating was really unhealthy. And so what I do, and I, and, and I, maybe this will make sense to you, um, is I typically eat healthy 90% of the week. And then 10% of the week, we'll have a cheat meal of the family, have some pizza, you know, ice cream. We have that. And the day after, I feel terrible. Like it's it's so it feels so horrible yeah. when I when I eat that unhealthy. Yeah. But the the problem is, and this is this is where I'm kind of going with this. What I struggle with is that that was so normal to me that I didn't realize it was an issue. Do you know what I mean? I, so like sometimes when you're totally immersed in it, you don't even realize that there are things screaming at you because those like people are exhausted normally. So they don't, they just think that's just how it is. So how do you like, how do you like differentiate that when you're right in the middle of it? Cause I think that can be sometimes, a, I know that was a problem for me and maybe that's a very personal issue, but I, I'm, I'm looking at you shaking your head up and down. That's not probably um, something that hasn't happened to other people as well. Well, the fact that you were able to recognize it the next day yeah. is terrific. 
because the goal is to be able to generate the awareness as soon as we are humanly possible. Some people, we might have an insight from something that happened to us 15 years ago, which is better than not having the insight alone. But the greater awareness we have, the greater we can be intentional about our actions. So if you get to a place where you're saying, okay, let's use food as an example, since you address that, that you really wanted to treat fuel as fuel as opposed to a reward. Mm -hmm. But it was so common to use food as a reward because it was happening all the time. It was fun. It was immediate. It was enjoyable. There were a lot of rewards to it. But if you didn't have that awareness the next day, right. that that was really sort of toxic, as fun as it was in the moment, it was not nourishing and it was not providing sustained long-term fuel. So you basically said to yourself, well, I can choose between happiness and energy for a couple hours, yeah. or I can look at it long-term. So that awareness you were able to translate into longer-term action, which is really key for any intervention. Yeah. And it's actually, so the, when people ask me, cause I, I get, I get, it's funny cause I get a lot, I get a lot more questions about health and wellness than I do education now, mm -hmm. because I think a lot of people, um, struggle with that. One of the keys that I said to kind of, that really helped me was to find healthy foods I enjoy and make that part of my routine as opposed to just eat healthy foods and like grin and bear it kind of just like, ah, I hate salad kind of thing. Cause like that, that's what was how I started. And I was like, I'll never be able to maintain this because I hate eating this every day. But then I would say, okay, what, what do I deem healthy and what do I actually enjoy? So I think a lot of times people think <laughs> that you have to give up joy in the moment for that long-term benefit. But I think it's kind of finding that balance of, of both. Like how do you actually find that stuff that does fuel you isn't, and maybe it's not as delicious as pizza and ice cream, but it's still, I still enjoy it. But I, I, I do have routines where I, I typically eat the same meal because I enjoy it so much, you know, six, seven times a, a week um, for, for breakfast. I eat probably four or five times the same thing for dinner because this is what I enjoy. I know how I'm going to feel after. And so I think that, that to me was, that, that's something I kind of connected with that is that you, it's not a, like, necessarily giving up something that brings you joy in the moment, but thinking about finding that balance of both. Would you say that's kind of something that you, you'd focus on? Well, here is what I would imagine will be the next step in that evolution. So you're at a place where you're saying, I'm going to eat healthy foods that I enjoy, which is fantastic because it's motivating. What I've been trying to emphasize, even in my own life, is how to make healthy foods enjoyable. Right. So whether it's sitting with the kids and taking a recipe that we saw online and putting it into practice or learning about foods or bringing foods in from the garden or just being creative or innovative with our process, even if we don't like it. You know, we did that um, food challenge where I gave all three of my kids, you know, the same ingredients like they did on the television right, show right. and asked them. So it was graded based on taste and health. So if you make the process fun and you can get creative with your recipes, um, you know, you might actually find that there are lots of foods out there that you wouldn't necessarily think that you would enjoy and you would. And that's sort of a great model, I think, for innovation in general. Love that. I love that. So uh, you and I are going to be in Monmouth, Monmouth, New Jersey. Give a little shout out because I said it wrong. So we're going to be there soon. And we're working with a, a group of educational leaders, administrators. And so you talked about kind of just like how we can create that systemically, right? So of course, I, I really do believe there's a lot we can control as individuals, but sometimes in a, an example, uh, a lot of times we will set up structures in schools where we do everything to burn out people mm -hmm. and then we'll offer yoga at the end of the day. Like that's going to fix it. And it's like, maybe just don't burn people out. <laughs> like maybe, maybe like I, I don't like yoga, so don't, just don't burn me out. And so, um, what is some advice that you're, you know, maybe would give, the administrators on like a systemic level on, on how you create that for the people you serve. 
I really like what you said about yoga. We actually have a very funny infographic, or I think it's funny. My kids encourage me not to think of myself as funny because it reduces their embarrassment. Right. But the, the, the infographic is self-care versus educator care. Mm -hmm. And on top, it's a person doing yoga with a funny sort of line that says, yeah, with all the stresses going on in education, the uh, mission pose is going to somehow make me better, <laughs> right? Right. As opposed to this idea that we have to um, recognize that we're doing the draining, we're imposing the stress. Mm -hmm. It's not the educators who are doing it all to themselves. Right. So self-care in itself is not going to be enough. So what is educator care? How do we, as, a, as an organization, create greater health for their individual benefit? And, and one of the ways I think we do that is sort of through our mindset. I'll sort of keep with the food theme because that's, mm -hmm. a, fa that's a favorite of most of ours, which is that in a uh, restaurant, you know, generally decent restaurant, they'll have one day a week where they all get together and they'll create a new recipe. So they're making the same food, the same dishes all week long, which is tiring. You know, if you're teaching the same lesson, if you're working on the same content, that really isn't always encouraging because you're not being as creative, maybe in the delivery process. So we can learn from restaurants. If we give people greater opportunities to say, how would I do this differently? Or how could students or my peers benefit from some unique approach or way of interpreting the content, then it gives them something to look forward to and uh, infuse them with a little good energy. So that's a mindset that I that I think of. I love that, and and I think that 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 serves people really well because um, they they are like a lot of people feel like mental health and physical health are two separate things, and I see them so deeply interconnected. And you know how we um, you know. It's, they, they, they work together. I don't, I, it's like for me, a little bit of a chicken, the egg. Like I know I feel better. Um, I avoid, for example, I avoid email and social media until I get my workout in. Cause I know I'm, I, I feel better equipped to deal with it. Uh, even positive and negative stuff, uh, after the fact, whereas it can actually drain my energy. I feel like in my body when I see something negative before I work out and I don't deal with it at the same. And I, so I, I just, I see that connection. So I'm really looking forward to uh, connecting with you in Monmouth, New New Jersey. <laughs> we'll make sure I say that right. And hopefully um, they get to see this uh, podcast before uh, we both join them and pick up some ideas and maybe uh, further the discussion, which is a wonderful thing. So Jared, thanks so much for your time today. It was great to kind of connect with you. I look forward to meeting you in person. Oh, me too as well. You're wonderful. I'm looking forward to talking in a couple months. All right. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thanks for being here.